Um, a quick intro. Um, my name is Gareth Hall. I'm the head of performance here at Sport 981. We're a UK athlete institute. So we've been operating since the early 2000s. Um, obviously, from then to now, I've had the luxury of working with a, a great group of different athletes, different organizations, different partners. Um, my role here is head of performance, so I get to line manage our S&C team. I still get to do a little bit of coaching myself, uh, and then I get to sit on our innovations team as well. And it's, the innovations team is a little bit like our think tank. Uh, it's what we're trying to think about the next training ideas, how do we improve winning potential with our athletes. And it's a little bit, it's a slice of that, which is what we're going to go through today. Um, to start with, why? You know, why look at Amiga Wave? Why look at Moxie? Indeed, why look at any of these technologies? So over the time, we've been really striving to move from a managed training situation to one where we're able to optimize and optimize daily. And what I mean by that is the process we usually do with our team, so multidisciplinary you know, periodization, uh, forecasting as you like, uh, to one where we can be a bit more objective, we can be a bit more personable and personal as to when and how or what we do with each of our athletes. So it's this mergence of these two areas which is what we've been interested in and that's what's brought these technologies to, to us over these years. I suppose the other thing I'll note is that we've had to reverse engineer how we've gone about achieving that. So uh, or anyone that's listening who's in coaching knows that the constraints of the coaching environment are quite different to an academic environment. Um, so unless we're advancing winning potential with our athletes, unless we know within the team that we have the capability of moving winning potential forward, we can't really use any of these technologies. We can't just use it because it's interesting. It's got to actually have an outcome that we can action. So we reverse engineer basically what do we need to do at the front line and then what can support us doing that. So where did we start? Well, we started really, you hear this all the time, context is king. Uh, and it was the realization of, we knew a lot about the sport context, you know, what do the best in the world do? Um, and we could break that down into nice digestible metric, you know, it's this fast or it's this strong or it's this percentage of first serves or whatever it may be. And we knew a lot about the sports environment, but we knew very little about our athlete specific context. So how well do they adapt living like this? You know, how well do they respond to typical training, recovery training, travel, heat, humidity, jet lag? How well do they adapt uh, to this context? And that was really a, a little bit of a ground zero point. So we knew the sport, but we really didn't know where our athletes were. So if we were going to optimize daily, that was the first thing that we needed to uncover. We needed to get a better grip on where our, our specific athletes' contexts were. That's where Amiga Wave came in. And we were lucky to work with Amiga Wave in the early 2000s with some of the football or soccer clubs. Um, but when it became portable, it really became a bit of a no brainer as to uh, looking at this context specific area that we wanted to look at. So we really summarize Amiga Wave by saying do our athletes thrive or survive within their environment? So have we got guys well adapted? Uh, yes, we have some adaption capacity to be able to push them a little bit we can move them into that winning potential easier? Or do we have guys who are really, yes, they're able to produce the external markers of performance, but they're surviving a lot. There's a lot of fluctuation in the data. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not good. Um, and that was critical for us. And so to start with, we really, we really went to this point to be able to better adapt uh, what we did with our athletes on a daily basis. And indeed, the Amiga way gave us that acute response. Where are you today? So if I'm going to do some daily optimization with you, literally, where is your adaption profile? What should I do? And it also gave us the capacity to look over time, what's the microcycle like, what's the meter cycle like? So in our quest to optimize, this was really a groundbreaking opportunity. We could find out, yes, we know what the sport requires, but now we can find out what you're like, how you're coping, and what we could potentially do to optimize your training better on a daily basis. And we use that for quite some time just on its own. You know, this kind of level of data is what we utilize to try and move our winning margins forward. And it was pretty successful. Um, over time, we were searching for how to quantify what to do with them live in a more objective way. Uh, and really, that's where Amiga Wave came, uh, sorry, Moxie came in. 
Moxie gave us the flip side of the coin. We knew where you where your adaption capacity was, but we could now look at how you adapted live in the training environment. So what cost are you paying in the training environment that we're delivering now? So where, you know, what limit are you hitting? How are you compensating? Ultimately, what's the adaption likely to be at the end of this training session? And critically here, this, this bottom bullet point. So what dose response could produce the most favorable adaption given your current adaptive profile? So there's a quick summary between Amiga Wave and Moxie with what we were trying to achieve. Both techs were having uh, allowed us to look at the athlete's functional systems and their adaptability to stress. Both gave indications of acute and chronic change, improvements in you know, detraining. Amiga Wave, yes, looking at regulation shifts and overall adaptability. And Moxie obviously playing around with THP and SMO2 and resting levels and capacity to, to DSAT, et cetera. So they both met the criteria we needed to be able to optimize daily. So we could have this pre-planned approach, you know, the, the, the good multidisciplinary periodized model, but we could start fine tuning that on a daily basis, both with what the adaptions like and then a dose response of what we're trying to do with them. Now, the second part of this um, I want to explore, and it's an adapt to fit your context. But it's certainly not here as a formulaic approach. You, you, it's to stimulate some thoughts. Um, you've got to realize there is no real formulaic approach. You've got to become a coach. You've got to become a, a decision maker with it. And from those decisions, you need to learn what's effective and what's not with your athletes. So don't take this as gospel, but it's there just as a jump, up, jump off point to discuss some of the tech. Um, the athletes we're going to look at here are invasion sports athletes, uh, reception based, intermittent speed athletes. So think people like soccer, uh, racket sports. Um, some of these guys have relatively normal external data. So GPS and fourth platform for the cost of living in this environment and doing these tasks varies enormously day to day. So the first group, um, and we're going right at the top here, uh, these are our best guys. These are, I've termed them elites here. Um, Olympic medalists, world champ superstars. And we've been super lucky to be able to work with this caliber of athlete. Um, what did we learn when we approached this optimization model with them? Well, a great percentage of those guys thrive. You know, think of that Amiga wave, thrive and survive. These guys are thriving. So they're positively adapted to the environment. So we tend to see very consistent data from these guys, not a lot of fluctuation in the data apart from planned overloading. overloading. So a lot of greens in the windows of trainability. So they're meddling and they also look like they're the best um, thrivers out of the group. When we added Moxie to see, well, how are you doing in session? We tend to see strong external performance data prior to, you know, prior to hitting our limiter. So one way, shape or form, they have found a way to gain some sort of balance between their mechanical profiles, their physiological profiles, so they can perform at a very little cost. So high performance outcome, minimal cost, super efficient. Um, and ultimately, they were doing this way before we looked at managing them. So they, the managed approach, the forecast approach, is actually very close to their optimal. It doesn't mean that we don't still optimize their routes. It just means that the dose of the optimization is small. We're looking at fine tuning these guys. Um, and that's good because their competition schedules are so hectic that there's very little development time anyway. Um, now, with the elites, it's worth noting one particular group of the elites, and these are the guys who have got fantastic tactical advantages. They read the game really, really well, and that's their strength. That's what they win on, and 19 out of 20 times, that, that's successful. These guys, though, you just have to be careful where they're not able to do that for whatever reason. They get boxed up in the game. They can't do what they usually do. Uh, and then they run into some physical problems earlier. They tend to hit their limiters earlier. They compensate accordingly. The dose is slightly different. And so the Amiga wave moves into the survival kind of response, an unusual response for them post game It's good to find that because the competition schedules are so hectic. We need to see it and then use the moxie and the windows of trainability to adapt their readiness for the next event so that we're, we're keeping them high as opposed to that's the start of a, a declining process. So with the elites, it's very much about fine tuning them, monitoring, watch for the road bumps. Large decisions about training need some careful consideration. These guys are already meddling. They're doing very, very well. If the Amiga wave is pretty constant, they've found a way. So it's to feather that towards maintaining it as opposed to going in there and just you know, ripping up the rule book and doing something different. 
So the elites look elite when we look at their optimized process as well as they are getting elite results. With non, well, these are still pros, but they tend not to be the medalists. So a different group of athletes. Um, so they tend to be outside of medal contention at the Olympics. They're not guaranteed that the starting 11 is something like the Premier League, above 20 in the world in a racket sports kind of position. Still phenomenal athletes, but there tends to be a difference between these guys and those elites. And, and when we looked, uh, they have a greater proportion of survival response uh, than thriving responses. And that's happening acutely, so it's one offs and chronically over time. Um, because of that response, they tend to have great fluctuations in their amoeba wave, and that might be DC, HRV, or energy, or a mix of all the above. And they tend to run into their limiter and compensate larger and earlier than the elites do. So their, their um, pre plan to optimum is not quite as good. These guys really need support. And you've got to figure out what to do for each individual. If you look on that sheet, I'm not giving really anything away because it's very difficult to. You're going to have to look at the data and figure out what each athlete needs to win more. Uh, but these guys need the support. So they still have uh, ideas. They still want to be a medal contender. They still want to get starting 11. They still want to break top 20. The comp schedule is very busy, so you need to, to be careful about when you push them and when you stop. Now, if you know what their adaption profile is like through Amiga Wave and you know what their limiter is through Moxie, you can better optimize the, the window of opportunity when you get it. So if you don't play on Saturday and you've got an opportunity to push them a little harder in the start of the week, you can choose to do that and dose them accordingly and still get them back to a ready state come next game. So these guys are the optimized uh, route. Uh, these guys are the ones that really need that. Inconsistent guys. Now, <laughs> there's all sorts of inconsistent performers. The guys we're looking at here tend to be big survivors again, not thrivers. Uh, so bigger limiters, bigger compensators as a result. Uh, and although you can get different types of um, inconsistent performers, the ones that we're talking about here tend to be the athletes on the outliers. So high and low on what the sports spectrum requires. So for us, that tends to be either powerhouses in repeat sports, repeat sprint sports, so a powerhouse trying to be in football, and we tend to have mixed delivery limitations with those guys. Um, ideas of what to do with them, you know, you've got to, the sport requires you to move them more towards repeat sprinting, and you've got to do that in a sport-specific way, and they still require that to get better and to, to win more. But you've got to do it in a way which has a thriving reaction, so their adaption profile and their efficiency, i.e. limiter, need to be improved. So markers in the data which tends to go along with these guys, improving resting, resting SMO2, speed of SMO2 recovery between the intervals, total amount of uh, DSAT and reset of SMO2, uh, MRI improvements, vagal density improvements, shape, time, and end values of DC. So if, if you're hitting those and improving your sports performance, you know the efficiency is getting better and the limiter is getting less, and you're likely to, to, to not have this inconsistent performance along the way as well. The other end of the inconsistent performance athletes are the ones who can't get influence within the game. They tend to lack the explosive characteristics. So good GPS data um, can actually acutely appear to thrive, but when you look at the data in a bit more detail, uh, they tend to have um, chronic vagal dominance patterns. So they tend to run on the engine quite a lot, and that's where they get their survival from. Um, Alongside that vagal dominance, they tend to be utilization limited, assuming there's no breathing related effect there. So what do we do with guys like this? Um, coaching wise, we use a mix of external and internal data. So the overarching goal is to reduce the volume down and enhance the intensity and gain some mechanical efficiency. So external markers, at cell, decel ratios, high speed runs, you can obviously break down the force loss profile and work on the efficient part of that profile to make them better. Um, Moxie you can use throughout all of that, but you can look at DSAT, recovery, repeat DSATs. Amiga Wave, we're looking at more balanced HRV because they're vagal dominant. So that's either less vagal power or just great sympathetic uh, power. Um, and that obviously improves the recovery pattern. Because you're working peripherally, you just need to watch for tissue overload. With guys like this, you know, if you need you at too fast one way, then we, we can start running into muscle pores and things like that. The last group that I was going to provide a little bit of information on here is the group I've termed as mindset. Um, 
these guys tend to be more with better. They're overtly focused on outcome measures. So they're not very process driven. More is better. Bigger kgs lifted, more training lifted, more of everything. They have high training monotony, so high doses, exceeds limiter all the time. More is better. What do we see with athletes like this? Large and potentially negative survival trends within the within the Amiga wave data. So SNS dominates sympathetic nervous system dominates the HRV. Uh, reduced MRI effectiveness, large deviations in DC all over the place, um, poor vagal power, so don't recover very well between bouts of exercise. Huge compensations in our world, that tends to be big oxygen uptake, large mechanical outputs, just mixed and midway limitations as a result. How do we optimize using both the Amiga Wave and Moxie with these guys? We tend to use the data to empower the athlete. This is a belief issue. Me adding my belief to them, it's unlikely to be effective. If I show them their adaptive profile, if I show them what they're doing live, it gives them the opportunity to learn from themselves, ask me or ask the team what this means, what they could do to improve it. And so they, they effectively learn from themselves and improve themselves and we can go back to coaching as opposed to trying to convince them of a different path. So a little bit of a summary for me, Amiga Wave and Moxie, they both provide information on the adaptability of your athlete to stress. Amiga Wave acutely and chronically on adaption capacity, Moxie on live and acute and chronic adaptions. Uh, both texts are incredibly useful if you want to try and optimize training alongside the, tra the traditional pre planned approach. And that's it. Great. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Gareth. Um, uh, we'll we'll uh, just go right over to Aaron. I think Aaron, Aaron's got a presentation as well. Uh, so we'll just. Uh, We'll go right over to Aaron next. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Good. All right. Okay. So I'm Aaron Davis of Train Adaptive All here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we've been using both the Omega Wave and, and Moxie now for, man, probably. Uh, four or five years um and uh for us the marriage of these two systems uh is i think for us the probably the cornerstone of what we do um and when we start looking at these uh monitoring technologies even what gareth was talking about right like i always like to try to keep it as simple as possible in the essence of what it really is even if that's monitoring from a wellness questionnaire or your force plates or a watch when it comes to speed. If we boil it down, it's all about energy. It's either the expression of energy, we're watching how the, the, the body is utilizing energy or maybe uh, trying to mobilize energy uh, for a given situation or environment. So it doesn't matter what we do and how complicated, because I think sometimes we, we can kind of get lost in the, in the weeds a little bit when we look at both the Omega Wave and, and Moxie. But if we really just look at it as from a very simple perspective that we're just looking at energy. Just like Gareth said, which is very, very interesting, and, and I love that he mentioned it, the fact that when he sees his elite athletes, we see these athletes' Omega Wave data just kind of plateau out, right? And in a good way, it stays steady and consistent. I always like to give an example of the fact that if you're the guy watching the seismograph on an earthquake, you like it when it doesn't say anything, right? Or it doesn't say a lot, you know, big fluctuations. If you see big fluctuations, then you know that there's something that's going on that's wrong, right? Uh, and it's very similar in this monitoring uh, aspect, and especially with the mega wave when we look at the adaptive uh, potential of, of an athlete. We just want to see things being consistent while hard work is still being done. Now, it is also good in this essence to seeing that energy starts being lower. What are the adaptations uh, that are happening within that? Or even when it, an athlete becomes depleted, right? That's where Omega Wave really comes in because in these altered states, we can see what part of the functional systems we need to address or we need to intervene, right? And in our space, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, and kind of deep dive on a lot of these athletes. Uh, and this gives us the roadmap of what system might be playing catch up, uh, which one is really strong. And, and Omega Wave really gives us that picture. 
Now, when we look at MOXIE, and this is just a representation of like one high intensity interval, uh, it's still the same thing. If we think of like what MOXIE is doing from an acute standpoint in real time, uh, within that workout, we're looking at energy being utilized and, and gained uh, within that session, all right? So it's always about energy. Uh, Omega Wave gives us more of that kind of that loading and that adaptation while Moxie's giving us that acute bout and, and being able to really monitor and intervene uh, in real time. Obviously, uh, when SMO2 falls, that's when the athlete is, is utilizing energy and then in the recovery period is when it comes back up and we know we're ready again for our next interval very very simple also too if we just kind of look at it from a very simplistic uh standpoint from both the 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 thb uh, which is the blood volume at that acute site and smo2 we can now say hey how much how big is this battery what's the capacity right and then how much potential, how, how much is that battery charged by the SMO2, okay? But at the end of the day, if this is an interval and I'm watching this, this just allows me to see what the energy status in that muscle is while the athlete is going in real time. So how do these guys talk to each other? Uh, they talk to each other in multiple ways, but I'm just going to pick this one uh, just because it's interesting. This is a field sport athlete, fast, uh, but if we really talk to the coaches, they're the ones that are saying that this guy doesn't have very good endurance, uh, work capacity is crap. Uh, they might even say uh, that he is lazy, right? Uh, and when we look at these athletes, especially on Omega Wave, we can start seeing uh, cardiac numbers being low. Uh, this aerobic and anaerobic status is just uh, a representation of the heart. And if we just think about it from a very simple uh, perspective, uh, if we're seeing anaerobic high and aerobic uh, low, we know that, that that heart is playing catch up now uh, within that environment. And so we really wanna change these numbers. And generally when we think and we see these athletes uh, and specifically when we had just the Omega Wave, uh, you know, there always is these, I come from the endurance background. And so I'm taking this athlete and I'm like, okay, we really need to, up the, the volume of this low end aerobic work, right? And we really didn't see huge changes. Uh, we knew there was an issue there, it was spotted, uh, but the intervention we chose didn't take into account some of the mechanical forces within this athlete. Here was the uh, kind of the monthly averages when we first started, obviously giving athletes a bunch of uh, road work uh, for this type of athlete will usually not be great. And that's just because when we start looking at these mechanical forces, uh, we have to realize that within the contraction of their sport uh, and activities they're doing, they can affect how blood flow is um, entering into the muscle and leaving the muscle. And with that said, we also have to realize that if there is inhibition of blood coming back to the heart, the heart's going to have to work quite a bit harder. And so that's really where Moxie has come in in the sense of looking at what does the contraction type actually affect some of these kind of physiological uh, parameters that we're picking up on the mega wave. If we have athletes that are doing their sport and they're constantly in arterial occlusion where they're blocking off both the inflow and outflow, uh, the heart's going to have to work just that much harder uh, for that given activity and duration. Granted, this slide here just shows a spectrum of how kind of we look at arterial occlusion. If we really think of arterial occlusion to the right, uh, for those Omega Wave users, uh, this is, let's say, a power lifter doing their 1RM. Uh, velocity is slow, force is high, creating a lot of tension. Uh, it's ideal in that sport, but it's probably not ideal for a marathon runner, which, and this is represented in actually when we uh, monitor runners or strength athletes. Right, we never seen a marathoner, at least not a good marathoner yet, arterial occlude during their sport. Uh, and likewise, I doubt I'm going to see a, a power lifter that's uh, super elite not create much tension and just do a compression force. Okay, so here's the spectrum. Right, <clears throat> just so you guys can kind of see a visual of what I'm talking about, what maybe an occlusion looks like. It's just that hose analogy. If I crimp one in the hose, fluid will build up on the other side. 
that crimping action is the muscular uh, forces to the capillary beds. One thing that we have to realize in, in sports performance, we always talk about things being fast uh, and powerful and, you know, we, we use these words that are that are very aggressive, but we also have to realize that uh, for athletes to perform their sport and the characteristics uh, that allow them to repeat these high aggressive contractions uh, is that they have to relax. Uh, and so this is actually from uh, super training. It's taken out of super training. And this is just from level one to your left to level five to your right, this is the different qualifications of athletes, five being elite, one being uh, the couch potatoes. And you see that contraction is a gentle slope, but the relaxation velocity is, is, is the bigger deterrent on what causes that athlete to be elite. But it's something that we don't talk about or we don't think about training with a lot of these athletes. So when we started this athlete, we, we started doing actually high intensity exercises, but at low force. In other words, maybe on a spin bike, but going at high RPMs with um, very low force. So he's just spinning. And the idea is that when we look at this from an acute standpoint uh, with the moxie, we're trying to allow the athlete to do high intensity bouts without occlusions. Okay. And we can walk, we can monitor that in real time. Even after the first month we can then start seeing that the heart doesn't have to work as hard are we training hard of course we are it's just that we're doing it in a different way to allow the athlete to recover because like gareth said before the best athletes right they should be just steady right and then that's kind of what we got from then on out right we got a steady increase but it's really just kind of just plateaued there and that's great even though we're still doing hard work Another example, which is something that's probably going to, you know, probably be talked about more uh, probably later when we start diving down into this, uh, you know, physiology here in a couple years, is the fact that what myoglobin can actually do. So myoglobin is uh, the heme protein that's attached to the muscle that gives the red tint. We started noticing that that role has a very unique role. And when we started seeing these athletes that would come in that was overtrained, we'd see these big parasympathetic shoots uh, on a mega wave. And it was always interesting to me is to look at these deviations from the norm and see like, well, what is actually happening? And what does this actually look like on uh, the moxie? And so we started seeing that we would have huge increases of SMO2 percentage and very low desaturation. Right. And so that's just one uh, high intensive bout. This athlete is going all out and can only desaturate about 10 percent. Right. And this was really the trend. High SMO2, low DSAT. And then on days they can come in and look normal. It would be a completely different picture. Huge desaturation, moderate SMO2 percentage. And the same. And so this really got me thinking of, okay, what, what are things that uh, potentiate that, that vagal tone or that over vagal expression? Uh, and it's interesting looking that even the, the moxie unit itself, if we really look at the signal, that myoglobin is a big part of that signal. And that's not a bad thing. I think people look at it as a bad thing, but we just don't understand the myoglobin's physiology. Myoglobin has a way to store nitrate and to turn into nitric oxide to help the cell kind of survive, right? And it also scavenges for nitric oxide, okay? But in overtraining states, systemically, you're gonna have a rise in nitric oxide. It's your emergency vasodilator, okay? But it also potentiates that parasympathetic activity. So when we come back up and we see these high parasympathetic states, we see these uh, that SMO2 gets limited because nitric oxide actually limits uh, cytochrome C oxidase in that mitochondria. So it actually stops the utilization of oxygen, okay? Not favorable for some of these athletes by any means. And so we really kind of dove in, uh, you know, to this and started looking at, well, how does this really affect moxie and then how does this affecting some of the chronic stuff we're looking at a mega wave right and it's really this myoglobin has tons of different interactions with our physiology that we just are not too keen on quite yet 
but it's something that allows us even for us, uh, you know, uh, long time Moxie users when SMO2 is desaturating really well, desaturating really well, then all of a sudden it just stops. Nobody told me what that was, right? Or what's going on there. And there's maybe a potential uh, case for it being this nitric oxide um, production from the myoglobin, uh, stopping the utilization of oxygen. And it's just interesting that from a peripheral standpoint, if we do that type of exercise too much, and we're going into this like survival mode within that muscular tissue, that it might throw off some of our autonomics, right? And it's something that when we look at this from omega wave and moxie, we can then, one, from the omega wave, we can then intervene because too many times we also hear about, oh, this athlete's stressed, they're very sympathetic, but we don't talk about that parasympathetic overshoot, which in my book is actually probably worse uh, because you still have utilization to the sympathetic side, but parasympathetic overshoot means that you're probably not getting great utilization. And ultimately, if we really think of that oxygen not being utilized by the cell, is probably one of the most unhealthy things. In fact, most diseases are in this state, right? Depression's in this state. We've, there's even research out there that, you know, cancer sometimes uh, represents itself like this. And so for us, when we see athletes push to this like overtraining state, we're looking at one, can we identify it on, on uh, you know, a mega wave? And then can we intervene by looking at what's actually happening with Moxie? Um, and if you use moxie enough and if you study myoglobin you can see that in those hard states uh, when the athlete and that tissue is really uh, beaten up doing low level aerobic work with very high smo2 buildup uh, will actually scavenge a lot of this nitric oxide uh, and even doing altitude training with let's say a respiratory trainer uh, with co2 will help reverse some of these it'll even help reverse the, the autonomics because the body will feel that it can actually drop off and utilize oxygen again and so it's these little i guess you could say uh nuances that we really look for to, to identify what's actually going on and for us we couldn't get that picture completely unless we had both systems um, so that's my little tidbit on kind of the marriage of both uh, Omega Wave and Moxie. Um, appreciate you guys' uh, time. All right. Th thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for presenting both uh, both Aaron and Gareth there. Uh, if anyone has questions, uh, please uh, submit them into the chat box on the uh, in the lower right of your screen. Um, I've got uh, a couple here. Um, so, so first of all, uh, if you see a conflict between the Moxie and the Omega Wave data, what do you what do you do about that? I suppose it's what kind of conflict? Yeah. Is it something that you see commonly? Uh, I mean, we can see. Sometimes the most common one that I would say is uh, that we see is that maybe the cardiac system looks really good on a mega wave, but then maybe what we consider like the, 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 the blood volume at the particular muscle might not reflect, say, an increase in THB when we would expect it to. Um, but then there's, there's tons of reasons for that. If the peripheral system is, say, if the muscles, as we know, even with uh, tensile myography, as muscles get more fatigued, they get more stiff. And so if an athlete is doing repeat sprint work or whatever else, and that stiffness might actually start limiting the blood flow in that area. Uh, but then there's also the obvious things that uh, when we look at cardiac, we don't think of like stroke volume. We think of, you know, we, we obviously think of heart rate, uh, but we don't think of stroke volume, contraction time of the heart. So there's a lot of different variables, how that heart kind of creates um, the output that sometimes we just can't capture unless we have some of these other, like maybe a physio flow or something that can really kind of dive in. Um, but those are the, that's, I would say that one's probably the bigger one that I see at, at times where we get a clear green light on the cardiac, but it's maybe not showing up uh, for whatever reason. And, and we generally can tease that out uh, on the, the THB side. Okay. Just, add, just adding to that, Roger, sometimes, and Aaron, I don't know whether you see this as well, uh, you sometimes get green lit cardiac on HRV data, but resting SMO2 is low relative to them. You know, so heart's good to go, but maybe there's a respiratory uh, fatigue issue that it's not picked up on in HRV data as well. Okay. Okay, great. Um, we've got uh, one here. 
um, this one may be, well, maybe you can comment it, comment on it now, but it might be one to follow up um, on the forum discussion. Uh, but it says, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I'm struggling to find peer reviewed studies on the use Oh, sorry, I should read the whole thing here. Uh, uh, I find the DC potential approach of Omega Wave very interesting uh, in, a, in addition to heart rate variability, but I'm struggling to find peer reviewed studies on it. its use in recovery monitoring. Can you help me out? Uh, Gareth, do you want to hit that one? I mean, yeah, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, I think there's two things there. I know Omega Wave have a number of studies on this that should be published in the next kind of six to 12 months. Uh, but beyond that, there is. It, I've actually got a load of data on that. So if they want, you know, send me some info, I can actually throw them a load of papers on it. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, uh, we will post this on our forum, and and so we can continue some of these discussions there as well. Um, another one here: How is the Omega Wave da data gathered, processed, and presented? Uh, the Omega Wave data is just uh, two to uh, ten minute tests, depending on what system you have. Uh, most of the athletes that we have that are mobile uh, are a two minute test when they when they wake up um, and it is used off their iPhone or, or Android phone. And it's, you know, we have one electrode on the forehead, one on the palm, and you have uh, the Omega Wave um, chest strap and it's gathered in two minutes and it's, you know, given right to your to the phone. I think there I think there's an option where the athlete might not be able to see it, which sometimes is good. Uh, and just so, uh, and then it's up into a cloud for the coaches to, to monitor. Okay. Uh, the next question, have you used tensiomyography with Moxie before and seen associations between the TMG results and Moxie outcomes during work? No, I haven't. I'd say that probably the person, uh, just been able to study the tensiomography is extremely expensive, but the, probably the expert in that field would probably be Landon Evans. He's, uh, he's done, uh, tons of work with both Moxie and Mega Wave and then tensiomography. Okay. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a handful of comments here about, we had some audio and, and some video difficulties, I think with the, uh, with the webinar software, it was a little glitchy today. Uh, just so everyone knows, we will be posting a recording of this uh, that should have those issues, uh, should not have those problems. So um, if you want to follow up later on that. Um, Aaron, do you recognize desaturation as an indication of minimum effective training effect? Uh, yeah, I would say that depending on what we're doing, uh... You know, if we're looking for desatch uh, in like, say, high power uh, outputs um, and generally the athlete does desat, we generally have like kind of norms for the athlete. It's very individual. You can't obviously put averages with athletes together across the board, but individually we can see specific desaturation time points and uh, percentages. And I just want to make sure that that looks normal. Uh, I, I always talk about it in the sense that like if uh, – you know, say if somebody is doing uh, an interval based method and their their only goal is like to hit 350 watts on every interval, say, and they have to repeat that every week, I would probably want desaturation not to be as low as week one, right? Because it become more efficient. Now, if I'm looking for high output in that same regard on each one and they're, they're maximizing their power, right? Their wattage on each interval. Then I would want, I should expect the normal desaturation that we look for on each interval. And the moment that they don't desaturate, uh, that's the moment we'll, we'll cut them off. Um, uh, because, and the reason why is that not the fact that they can't handle it and they can go in this survival mode and do a couple more reps. That's great. But it's the idea that we have to make sure that the next day they can come back and we go hard again. I think a lot of times when we think about this monitoring, we think that we're making athletes soft, but in reality, I think it's like, no, if we use it correctly, we can maybe get more intensive training that will actually move the needle a little bit more often. I think that's the goal. I think that's absolutely key. You know, in the fields we work within, tech has been largely been there to take away from athletes and that, 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 that stigma is there with the athletes. As soon as you bring some new tech in, they're thinking, well, is this going to stop me playing on Saturday? So actually using it for more, there's always a training outcome, whatever that may be. But you're trying to get more from these guys all of the time. 
And that, that is absolutely a key message. Okay, the uh, next question here. I'm new to Moxie, but have access to another uh, heart rate variability app. Uh, are there patterns with SMO2 and THB that are present during uh, sympathetic overstressed or parasympathetic overstressed? Is there patterns of SMO2 and THB that are present? Uh, <clears throat> well, just on the parasympathetic uh, overshoot side, you know, presented on, we're seeing that. On the sympathetic side, I don't, uh, I'd probably, you know, agree with uh, Gareth in the sense that they, they're big utilizers, right? They're, they're going to the well all the time. Um, but on the parasympathetic side, we're just seeing uh, probably lower utilization, which, you know, if we, like I said, if we look at that myoglobin physiology a little bit deeper, I think that'll probably tease itself out. On that, I suppose one of the thought or consideration, if, if, if you're able to profile the guys force velocity wise, particularly at the high velocity, high force requirements, to see what muscle stiffness characteristics, tendon compliance, you know, what's their mechanical efficiency like? Some of these guys who tend to be quite uh, vagal dominant, they're not that crash hot at that end of the force velocity spectrum either. So from a mechanical efficiency perspective, that's a good area to work with too. Okay, and then uh, they said, uh, thanks. How about extended reps and high intensity reps? Uh, extended reps versus high intensity reps in the sense of, uh, in, I guess in what context? Let's, uh, well, let's maybe come back to this one in the, in the forum um, if you'd like to uh, continue that discussion on the forum. Um, we're not with this format. We're not real good with the back and forth, so the the forum might be a better way to go. Uh, there. Just Twenty um, second sprints versus ten minute. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yep. I would say. Um, <clears throat> so I'm. If it's going to sound weird for coming from an endurance background, but I look at everything from a sprint coach's eyes, because in the sense that like we just talked about these mechanical forces from contraction, right? Uh, you know, when we see these mechanical forces, um, let's say occlusions happened it's just an intramuscular like bracing strategy right they just they have to like try to recruit a lot just to kind of make this coordination of the whole body happen uh at those desired uh, power outputs and so when we think of trying to train these athletes depending on the sport um i always think we got to be kind of close to whatever velocities or power outputs that they're they're producing and then ultimately try to make them more efficient so they can repeat this process over and over again and so we just have to identify what that looks like. If it's an endurance athlete, uh, what their coordination needs to be is whatever race pace is, right? So if they're a miler at four minute mile pace, then their coordination needs to be very efficient uh, at that pace. So then we want to train certain aspects or certain intervals around that um, that pace. And, and by using Moxie, we can then again, just like I said before, if we have an interval of 350 watts every interval right and we do that on week one i shouldn't see that same desaturation maybe less desaturation by like week four or six and it's very similar when we think of endurance training uh, say that four minute mile pace if that's 60 second per quarter if i do that over multiple you know weeks i would see hopefully less desaturation right more efficiency at race pace more coordination at race pace and then extending it right uh and so it's not that 10 minute runs are better than 20 second sprints or vice versa. It's just really trying to marry, uh, you know, the, the intervention with what the athlete actually needs. Okay. I think we'll, we'll take uh, one last question here and then we'll, we'll finish up. Uh, Gareth, do you think that Omega wave would be more accurate to measure heart rate variability if the assessment was while sleeping? when in theory there is not any kind of voluntary disturbance from the person uh for example the changing in breathing rhythm for sure i think there's there's a whole heap of data out there on sleeping hrv um working in the line that we work within it would be hard to get our guys to do that um so there, there, are, there are inevitable pitfalls as to when they take it but as long as you contextualize when they've taken it and it's normalized each time. So if they take it in the morning, 30 minutes after getting up, with no food, no caffeine, and none of that, and that's when they do it, and as long as it's baseline and get a continuation of the meeting, then that's more realistic for us to be able to obtain. Um, likewise, if they're away and they're traveling and we only get it in the hall before we go competing, at least we get what you like before you go on. 
So I suppose to some degree it's the environmental constraints of getting the guys to do it. There's value in looking at this sleeping HRV for sure, but in, in our experience getting guys to, to, to do that regularly is very difficult. Okay. Uh Thank you so much for uh, for giving the presentations and, and answering the questions and, and uh, thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to Mikhail at Omega Wave. Uh, it was his idea for uh, uh, putting this webinar topic together and he helped with the organization of the event. Uh, so a big thank you to Mikhail. When I when I send out the follow up with the uh, with the recording, I will also send the, the contact information for Mikhail if you'd like uh, more information on Omega Wave. Um, so with that, uh, I think we'll wrap it up for today. And thank you again to everyone. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.